Okay, great. Um, so hi everyone and welcome to um, this joint webinar. Um, it's being hosted jointly by the Child Protection Gender-Based Violence Community of Practice um, under the Child and Adolescent Survivors Initiative, um, or what we refer to as CASI for short, as well as the Gender-Based Violence Area of Responsibility um, Community of Practice as well. Um, as I shared um, just a minute ago, just a quick note that this webinar is being recorded and the recording will be shared following the session. Um, just to introduce myself, my name, um, for those of you who may not be a part of the Child Protection Gender-Based Violence Community of Practice, um, my name is Jennifer um, Lee and I facilitate the CPGBB Community of Practice. Um, I'd also like to give a minute um, to my colleague, Sarah Martin, um, just to introduce herself as well as she's our um, co-host um, from the GPB AOR community of practice. Um, Sarah, I can hey, also can show the next slide, slide, which gives more yeah. information on the GPP. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Martin, and I'm one of the two facilitators for the GBV AOR community practice. We are over 780 uh, gender-based violence specialists uh, working around the world globally in humanitarian um, settings. And uh, if you work in GBV and you're interested in joining us, you can send a message to me at gbvcop at gmail.com, and uh, we'd be happy to, uh, to invite you in so you can join us to build your uh, capacity on responding to GBV, join our webinars, and be a member of our loving family. So thank you, Jennifer. Great. Awesome, Sarah. Um, and thanks for providing that info on the GBV AR community of practice. If you are a GBV professional, I highly recommend it. Um, I'm a part of it, and it's been super helpful for me, um, and I'm, I think a lot of others as well. Um, just, I'm going to just quickly move through some of the intro stuff because we do have a lot to cover. I think for those of you who are on the CPGBB community of practice, we do a little bit more usually of um, feedback, et cetera, but I'm gonna jump into actually um, the session. Um, and I see people introducing themselves on the chat, which is great. So thanks so much um, for those of you who are doing that. And I highly recommend others to do so as well as we'd love to um, get to know better who's on the session with us. Um, so before I actually introduce all of our guest speakers and facilitators, what I wanted to do was to uh, do a quick poll just to sort of warm us all up um, for the discussions and to kind of see in the room um, how we sort of think about um, persons with disabilities and specifically children and adolescents, um, as well as um, those who have may have, um, who are a survivor of gender-based violence. Um, so on your screens, you should see a poll being launched. Um, and there are a few questions. I was hoping that these would come up one by one, but I think they all came up at once. So, um, if you just take a few minutes and respond to some of these statements that are on the screen. The first one um, says, children and adolescents with disabilities need information about gender-based violence so that they can engage in healthy relationships. So um, strongly agree, agree, disagree, or strongly disagree. I'll say that again, children and adolescents with disabilities need information about gender-based violence so that they can engage in healthy relationships. Um, the second question, there's a little bit um, more in there in terms of nuance. So children and adolescents with disabilities need information about gender-based violence so that they can engage in healthy, consensual, sexual relationships in the future. Um, so again, the options are strongly agree, agree, disagree, um, and strongly disagree then children and adolescents with disabilities should go to separate, more accessible, safe spaces to enjoy, to avoid being harmed or harming others. So again, children and adolescents with disabilities should go to separate, more accessible, safe spaces to avoid being harmed or harming others. And then finally, girls with disabilities are safer if they stay inside their homes. Um, the last statement again is girls with disabilities are safer if they stay inside their homes. Um, so I see 
many people filling out um, and I'll show the results of the statements um, after we have a, give a chance for everyone to respond. So, Looks like a little more than half have responded already. So if you haven't already, please take a, another minute or so to share. And don't worry, this is completely anonymous. <laughs> so I cannot see who is answering what. Um, so please answer openly and honestly. Um, and really, I think it will only serve to help the discussion um, just to get a good understanding of where we're all starting from. Okay, so looks like there's a few more people who haven't responded. I'll give another 15 seconds and then um, I'll share the results with you all. So we have 75% of us who voted, great. All right, it looks like most of the voting has stopped. So why don't I go ahead and end the poll. Thanks everyone for participating in that. Um, I'll share the results on the screen. So it looks like 86% of us um, strongly agree that children and adolescents with disabilities need information about gender-based violence so that they can engage in healthy relationships. 8% um, agree and then 5% um, strongly disagree. Um, so I, I am curious to hear more from those who sort of strongly agree and strongly disagree, sort of some of the reasons um, why you responded in this way. And if you wanna share on the chat, feel free. I don't think we have a ton of time to launch into discussion right now about it, but I think we'll be getting into some of um, the underlying sort of um, issues and beliefs around that um, in this session um, with our facilitators. Um, in terms of the second question, um, it looks, uh, sorry, uh, children and adolescents with disabilities need information about GBV so that they can engage in healthy consensual sexual relationships in the future. Again, um, similarly, it's 86% um, strongly agree, 8% agree, and the 5% strongly disagree. So it looks like the same breakdown. Um, and interesting also that, um, yeah, it kind of came out with the same results. Um, and then number three, children and adolescents with disabilities should go to separate, more accessible, safe spaces to avoid being harmed or harming others. 5% strongly agreed, 3% agreed. Most of you, 57% disagreed, and then 35% strongly disagree. So there's a little bit of, um, I think, more difference there in terms of those who disagree versus strongly disagree. So again, we'll be curious to hear some of all of your thoughts around that. So please feel free to, if you have any strong feelings or questions to write them in the chat box. And again, we'll um, get into it more during the discussion. Um, and then finally, girls with disabilities are safer if they stay inside their home. Um, so most of you either disagreed, 41%, um, or strongly disagreed, which is 59%. Um, so as I, shared earlier, I'm not going to launch into discussion about these now, but I think um, let's all try to keep them in mind as we continue on with the dis discussion, um, because sort of, again, the sort of underlying beliefs, attitudes, um, thoughts will come up as hopefully as we discuss. And I think um, our guest speakers and facilitators are much more um, expert and experienced than I am than in um, leading us all in discussion around these. Um, so in that um, vein, I would love to actually introduce um, our guest speakers and facilitators. So today I'm very, very excited and honored to have um, three really sort of, I think, experts and pioneers in this area. Um, first, we have Elham Yousefian. Um, she's the Inclusive Humanitarian Action and Disaster Risk Reduction Advisor with the International Disability Alliance. Um, and she'll be leading us in a discussion um, around the rights-based approach. Um, and then we have Emma Pierce, um, who's a gender and inclusion consultant, who's really um, led a lot of this work around how do we sort of work and support, best support children and adolescents um, 
who um, had GBV perpetrated against them and who are also um, um, persons who um, are living with disabilities. And she also does a lot of work in general around inclusion um, um, and gender, obviously, based on her title, um, and has really contributed to a lot of the really practical and helpful resource packages out there, which um, she'll be sharing more about later on in this session. And, and then finally, we have Betsy Sherwood, who's the Senior Advisor for Child Protection at Child Fund International. Um, and so I'm really excited to have um, these three women here on the session with us. And to sort of kick it off, um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Elham, who will lead us in the discussion um, around the rights-based approach. Um, so Elham, if you want to take yourself off of um, if you want to put yourself on video and take yourself off of mute, that would be great. And I'll stop sharing my screen so everyone can um, see you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, uh, everyone. I'm so honored to be part of this uh, wonderful and very important discussion. Um, my name is Elham, and I'm working with the Secretariat of the International Disability Alliance. International Disability Alliance is an alliance of organizations of persons with disabilities, which, by which I mean organizations which were built by and administrated and uh, run by persons with disabilities themselves. Um, working towards uh, advocating for rights and equality for persons with disabilities around the world. Um, today, I want to talk to you about a very... ...looking issues of persons with disabilities from a rights-based approach. Um, on paper, it's quite easy. Yeah, do persons with disabilities have human rights? I think 99% would say yes. But in practice, it's quite uh, difficult and may cause challenging, uh, real challenging that even for us, as those who have been working in the disability sector still arise. Mm, so let me start by having a look at the concept of disability. You, all of you may think that you really know what do we mean when we talk about a person with disability. But I want to challenge this understanding a little bit. Um, so some, pe you know, some people have impairments. That's the reality of life. Uh, but what kind of impairments we are talking about? Uh, most people just imagine someone in a wheelchair when you talk about disability. But this is just part of the reality. We have people who have physical disabilities. We have people with uh, visual disabilities, people who are blind, people who are partially sighted or have low vision, uh, who have their own like challenges. People don't understand that this person has a, a limited uh, vision, so they would need support on some stuff. Then we have people who have intellectual disabilities, which means that they would need more support in understanding. And then we have people with communication challenges, people with psychosocial disabilities, or what people would mostly call mental health conditions. So all of these groups are categorized as people with impairments. Um, but what causes disability is not just the impairment. What actually causes disability is impairment plus barriers. Um, the society is built for those who uh, don't have any impairment, can see completely, hear, walk, understand, and their um, mental, uh, mental status is like what is defined by the public as the normal. But anyone who is not exactly on the same uh, line or on the same descriptions would face challenges using society and navigating in the society on an equal basis with others. Um, so let me give you one example of these barriers. Barriers, you may first of all think of uh, uh, stairs where someone with, with a wheelchair can't come up. But barriers, these are part of barriers. Yes, they are environmental or physical barriers. But in addition to these barriers, we have 
attitudinal barriers. Uh, like for example, if you see a, a blind woman, you would say, okay, she can't cook because she's blind, right? This is your attitude that may act as a barrier for her because you wouldn't tell her, why don't you cook for yourself? Or why don't you choose your dress? This is the attitude that is acting as a barrier. Then we have uh, barriers in communicating information and giving them the information they need to have. For example, uh, let's give a COVID-19 example. Um, somebody is deaf, so they communicate through sign language. But when, the, uh, when there is an announcement just in voice saying that today after seven o'clock, nobody can go out, so you should all stay at home, but this person can't listen, can't hear that. And then they wouldn't get the information. Here, this is the barrier that this, the information is not given in the formats that all citizens would be using. It's just given in the mainstream uh, format, which is plain English language, not formats that other people would be using. So here, lack of communication accents acts as a barrier. And then finally, there are policies and laws that act as barriers. For example, uh, they say, if you have intellectual disabilities, you can't have a bank account because uh, we think you can't manage your, your money. So you need somebody to help you to manage your money. So here, government policy acts as a, uh, as a barrier. What I'm trying to say is that what causes disability is impairment plus barriers which ends up the person not having uh, equal rights and equal opportunities in the society with, uh, on an equal basis with others. So uh, if there is no barrier, there would be no disability in many cases. Like, let me give one example that I always give to people. Uh, okay, I am blind and I was born blind. Imagine that uh, you and I go to a restaurant to have dinner. If uh, the restaurant is equipped with uh, some directing lines on the floor that helps me to find my way. And then the menu to order the food is in Braille, which is the way that a blind person can read. Then I can choose my food equally like you. So I would order my food and you would order your food. We would eat lunch together and then we would go back home again using the accessible transportation. So here I have no disability, but if we go to the restaurant and there is no uh, accessible space, there is no accessible menu for me, I can't pay my bill, I can't go back home, you, I, you need to help me, I need to ask support from others, I, you need to read the menu for me, then I would have to choose very quickly and not really thoughtfully, then here I'm facing discrimination. I don't enjoy uh, this lunch on an equal basis with you, this means that here I'm experiencing disability, but this, is, but this disability is caused not just because I can't see, it's caused because the society is not ready to serve me and uh, adapt my needs on an equal basis with you. So uh, I hope it's, it, it was not too long, but I think this is very helpful to change a little bit and challenge a little bit our understanding of uh, disability. When we talk about right-based approach to disability, uh, one major thing is to consider persons with disabilities as decision makers, those who can decide for their lives, maybe on different ways. Maybe the decision is something that you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't take, but that's how life is. Each person decides for their own, based on their own uh, rules and goals in life. So, uh, but, this is something that we need to consider in our roles that still they can make the decision. Maybe they need more support, they need information to be communicated to them in a, a way that they can understand it. So for example, you are managing a, a GBV case against a girl who is deaf. So in order to let her decide what she wants to do, you need to communicate the information to her in sign language or write down for her. If you do that, then she would be able to make the decision that is needed from her, or she needs to make for her own life. Uh, or for example, if there is a girl with uh, intellectual disability, you can 
communicate with her with visuals. Uh, people with intellectual disability are very strong when it comes to images and visuals. So you can adopt a, an easy language. You can use uh, uh, visuals and uh, plays and just tell them what happened and ask them what they want to do. And sometimes these uh, persons with intellectual disabilities or persons with communication challenges have a close uh, person, maybe a family member, maybe a friend, uh, who can support the communication quite well. One feature is that they are the decision makers, so we should uh, we should not consider them um, as decision uh, that those who can't make the decision. Um, I see I'm running kind of short of time, so I just want to wrap up by one very important point, which I could also see in the polls that we just had. Do persons with disabilities really need a special places, a special support, special everything? Uh, uh, for example, a bathroom for persons with disabilities, a playroom for persons with disabilities, a library for persons with disabilities. Right based approach says no, persons with disabilities should be and must be able to use the mainstream as much as possible. And this is a very important rule because that would uh, help to break the barriers, that would help to change the attitudes. And that's exactly what we mean by right based approach. Uh, mainstreaming. So the, the mainstream uh, facilities should be adopted and made accessible for persons with disabilities and we should avoid uh, as much as possible specialization and segregation. This is a key to change the attitudes and uh, achieve the goal of equal rights and opportunities for persons with disabilities. I'm handing over back to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Okay, perfect, Elham, and thank you for being so good about keeping the time too. You made my job easier. Um, I think one, just thank you, Elham, for that super clear and sort of, yeah, comprehensive overview of the different types of disabilities, the causes of disability, and particularly the attitudinal barriers. Um, and really the rights-based approach. And as you were speaking, I was just thinking about sort of particularly when we talk about children and adolescents with disabilities. Um, well, let me take a step back. Children and adolescents in general, I think oftentimes we forget about already the resilience, right? And the rights that they have as children and adolescents. And then if we kind of add on to that, if they're a child or an adolescent with a disability also, really thinking about the fact that they're rights holders as well, right? So um, if they're children and adolescents with disabilities, they do have the right for their opinions to be heard, right? And to be a part of the decision-making process. That doesn't change when they have a disability. And again, that gets to those attitudes because I think oftentimes um, we as adults feel like they need to have decisions made for them, whether they have disabilities or not. And when a disability is added, sort of our vulnerability lens, in a sense, increases rather than really remembering that, one, they're resilient to their rights based rights holders, right? Um, so I really like and appreciate that framing. And then to add to that, then that third level of being a survivor of GBV and really wanting to make sure that we're always giving power back. Um, and again, obviously, survivors are decision makers and rights holders, too. Um, I think. Emma and Betsy will get into a little bit more about what that looks like in practice and discuss particularly around the age and developmental stage. Um, but before I do that, um, are there any quick questions for Elham um, while she's front and center um, on the screen? There's additional time for Q&A at the end of the session, but if there are any specific questions for Elham, um, please feel free to write them in the chat or put yourself um, on video or take yourself off mute. I'll wait um, about less than a minute for people to chime in if there are any specific questions, but otherwise, again, we have the time later on. Um, any questions? Okay. 
it sounds and looks quiet on the chat. Um, so why don't I move on then? And then um, please um, be sure to write questions as they come up for you in the chat box. Um, Sarah Martin is graciously keeping track of all of that. Um, so thank you, Sarah. Um, so I'm going to sh um, reshare my screen and then pass over to Emma um, to begin um, bringing us through some of the specific risks. Um, so over to you, Emma. Thanks a lot, Jennifer, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, and thanks to Elham for that great presentation and for setting the scene so well for some of the content that we're going to be covering today. Um, I wanted to start out by just sharing with you um, so what we know globally about disability and, and some of the risks that people with disabilities face. So most of you will be familiar with the, the statistic that 15% of any population um, will be persons with disabilities. And, and the World Report on Disability also highlights that actually it goes up to about like 19% when we start to look at the female population. Um, and that's because obviously there is um, inequity and inequality between men and women, which can result in, um, in the female population actually having a higher rate of disability. Um, we also have some evidence now that in um, populations affected by crisis and conflict that there can be a larger number of people with disabilities, almost up to 20% of refugees might have a disability. We have some statistics that are mostly from developed countries. So countries like the United States and, and Australia, which say that persons with disabilities are four to 10 times more likely to experience violence than their non-disabled peers. And children with disabilities are three to four times more likely to experience all forms of violence and three times more likely to experience sexual violence than their non-disabled -dis peers. So that's real food for thought when we start to think about um, our engagement in um, the humanitarian world. If those are the statistics about relating to violence in developed countries, countries where you know, we, have dis we have services and assistance that are provided to persons with disabilities, what might it be like in a context where perhaps there is conflict, where we have had a breakdown of um, social norms, of also um, a breakdown of sort of uh, our protective peer networks. What, what kinds of rates of violence could children and adolescents with disabilities be experiencing in those spaces? Next slide, please, Jennifer. We shared um, some case studies with you all. I hope you had a chance to read through these. They're just two case studies that we're gonna be focusing on today. One is, um, the first case study is of a 17 year old woman called Selem. And Selem is living in a refugee camp in Ethiopia. She um, has a big family that she lives with, um, three brothers, five sisters, She's unable to speak um, and needs assistance with her daily care. And her mother has been increasingly finding it hard to support her um, with all of the needs that she has, um, particularly since she started menstruating and has grown, grown bigger, she's growing into an adult. Um, it becomes increasingly hard for the family to, um, to give her the kind of um, privacy that she needs in their shelter in this refugee camp in Ethiopia. There's a bit more information in that case study that we'll let you unpack as you go through the activities today. The second case study is Inam, and Inam is 16 year, years old living in Beirut, um, again, a refugee. She actually um, started to have difficulty walking over three years ago, and she's been having lots of medical care, lots of medical services, but unfortunately, as she's um, lost her ability to walk. She has had to drop out of school. She's now finding that her friends aren't visiting her as much. And her father, who is the sole carer for her, is very much worried about her, um, her, her, her psychosocial well-being. She's um, expressed a desire um, to hurt herself and, 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 and he's very, very worried about her. She's also very concerned about what her future holds. She can't see a future. She says that there, she doesn't, she's very worried about whether she'll be able to get married and to have children in the future now that she can't walk. So these are two, just two case studies um, that we wanted to focus on over the course of the webinar today. The case studies that we share with you today and the case studies we'll share next week are actually real examples. They're people that Betsy and I have met in, in person and, 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 and you know, they're very kindly shared information with us um, for the purposes of, of learning and, and, and for us to learn better how we can help um, different people and support different people like this. 
So I'd just like to pause for a moment and given the limited information that we've shared so far, what might be some of the risks that you would be concerned about for Selem and Inam? Can I just ask for a couple of people to maybe, maybe make a contribution from the group? What, what risks might you be concerned about and what do you think might be contributing to those risks? Oh, we have a very quiet group. If you could just unmute yourself. Hello, I can hear someone. <laughs> and oh, it's Jennifer. Quick, yeah, it's just a quick note that um, Betsy and I have, um, I've shared the document in the chat and Betsy's also um, graciously written out the case studies in the chat if you wanted to take a look again. Um, but I do see um, Zainab's responded, so I'll hand back over to oh, you, Emma. Great. Um, so facing, so Zainab says that, that one of the factors contributing to risks is that, they, that these, um, these young women might be facing discrimination in the community or even being abused by people. Um, particularly if they're being left alone for prolonged periods of time that unfortunately can be seen as an opportunity by many perpetrators. And we do have examples of that through our experience and research in different contexts. Um, other, there's lots coming in now. We've got isolation due to both stigma and lack of appropriate support. Um, accessing wrong or misleading information on the internet. Yeah, if Inam doesn't have anyone she can talk to about her worries about being a woman who can't walk and wondering about her future, and maybe she's um, searching the internet for information, maybe she'll get the wrong information when she's on there not being able to explain to service providers what has happened to her. So I think you're referring to Selem then there. Uh, because Selem has a different way of communicating, sometimes um, service providers may not be able to, be, may not be aware that something is wrong and Selem may have tr difficulty explaining what has happened to her to different people. Um, now there's a lot of comments in the chat box. I think that's great. Thank you so much for starting to um, sort of engage with these case studies. One more quick question for you, if we could just shift a little bit. Do you see any protective factors in these case studies? Do you see any things that are good that could be protective and, and helpful to them? So someone is talking about Selem's communication. So yes, in Selem's story, we say that she, um, she is able to express um, her emotions through smiling. She's able to express to her family when she needs food. Um, so she has a way of communicating. It may not be the way you and I communicate, but we are able to tell what makes her happy, what makes her unhappy, um, and perhaps be able to identify when she's okay or not okay with something that's happening to her. Um, people are, a lot of people are saying that the families are, um, are a source of support. And in fact, Inam's father is a very positive role, you know, perhaps a positive role model in her life because she's very, he's very concerned about her and he is, um, you know, we, we do have to, and he's seeking assistance for her, which is, which is great. And we have to look at, um, at caregivers and, and, and understand a lot more about how we support caregivers, especially those that are, um, are um, positive, um, positive um, support people in, in a person with disabilities um, life. So we will be talking a lot more about that next week. Now, in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on. Thanks for starting the discussion. We're going to be breaking up into groups shortly. So we'll get to talk more about these case studies. But I did wanna give you some information about what we know from a humanitarian context from the research that has been done. Um, we know that girls with disabilities and both girls and boys with intellectual disabilities are at high risk of sexual violence due to primarily their lack of access to information and their exclusion from protective peer networks, which, as we know, in the adolescent period is the time when we get a lot of our information from protective peer networks. We get, we learn about our bodies, we learn about menstruation, we learn about sex, um, oftentimes from these more informal communication networks and information sharing networks. And if you're excluded from those networks, you miss a whole bunch of information. Um, we also know that refugee children with disabilities are usually living in households that are facing added socioeconomic stress. And this is because they often have to outlay a lot of extra money for medical services and, and, and for just transport and travel um, and a whole range of, of things that cost them money. 
We also know, uh, and that's why we often talk about disability and poverty being very intricately linked in, um, in, the, in both the humanitarian and the development sector. And what happens when you're living in a, in a household with added socioeconomic stress? Well, we see an increase in physical and emotional violence in the home sometimes. And we also see the adoption of negative coping strategies. And some examples of these strategies could be children going out um, and actually sourcing income for the family by begging on the streets. Um, we also see um, cases where children might be left unsupervised or families might rely on unfamiliar caregivers to help um, care for a child with a disability while they go out and try to source appropriate income or assistance. And we have had reports of child marriage of girls with disabilities, and I'm quoting here from the people we've spoken to who said that they are married before they become, I quote, less desirable due to both their age and disabilities. Um, one point that I didn't, um, that I need to touch on here is we also know that families are very afraid of, um, of, of, of violence. They've, and they, and they are, uh, and when they're struggling to be able to um, survive and to cope it, as a household, we have had some instances in countries such as Lebanon where residential institutions are available, where families have asked for their children with disabilities to go to these residential institutions. Now, the reason I've got this up here is because it's actually a big red flag for us if children with disabilities are being sent to any kind of residential institution. The global evidence that we have demonstrates that these institutions can be places where there is a high risk of, of, of violence, all types of violence, but, but se including sexual violence. So wherever possible, we want to support families to be able to, um, to survive and to be healthy and, and to, and to hope, be resilient in their given situations um, and to avoid residential institutions wherever possible. Next slide, please, Jennifer. Um, we also know that disability can add to the risks for other women and girls in the household. So, for example, we do have examples in um, humanitarian contexts where the head of household has maybe acquired a disability. Um, and when that happens, oftentimes um, you can find adolescent girls being pulled out of school to help care for people with disabilities in the household, reducing their access to education and other opportunities. Um, we've also uh, heard a lot of mothers describe difficulties adjusting to having a child with a disability, um, oftentimes having a lot of fear and depression about the future for them and their child. And this is really exacerbated in humanitarian contexts where everything is so uncertain. Um, and we do know that there is oftentimes a lot of breakdowns, a lot of households will break down, will split up. Um, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers may separate. Um, when um, there is a child with a disability in the household. And um, that obviously sends that household and that child, that child and their family into a cycle of poverty and socioeconomic um, disadvantage, um, disadvantagement. The other thing I wanted to point out is, here is our case studies all and all the, all the evidence that we've collected over the years shows that there is a really strong intersection between gender, disability and psychosocial support or well-being. So we have seen a lot of examples where children with disabilities have witnessed violence and other traumatic events and demonstrate regressive behaviours just like other children, but no one really notices it and no one recognises it. They all associate it as being the disability and perhaps they don't get the access to services and assistance that other children would get. Um, and this is particularly important if that child has maybe experienced uh, some form of sexual violence. Um, it may not be recognised. That regressive behaviour or those changes in behaviour may be, may be uh, we find oftentimes are incorrectly attributed to the disability um, and not to the event that has occurred to them. Um, we also know that adolescents and young people with new physical disabilities, which happens a lot in conflict settings, um, will, um, will really be excluded from so much of the um, age appropriate kind of GBV and sexual and reproductive health information and activities that are out there for, for adolescents and youth. And we find that that does um, lead them to be uh, so isolated that it, they experience depression and suicidal ideations and even attempts. So we do have reports of that. 
And the reason I bring these up is because I don't think we can separate out sexual violence from all these other forms of violence that children with and adolescents with disabilities might be experiencing. We have to see um, the whole child and all of the combination of experiences that they have had, what their true lived experience really is. Next slide, please, Jennifer, which is my last one before I'll hand over to Betsy. Awesome. If you could go a little quickly sure. on this one so we have enough time so for activity. Thanks. I actually have covered most of what is on here. There is uh, nothing new here um, from what I've covered in, other, um, in the other slides. Um, I would just say that the one that perhaps I haven't mentioned is that we also know that when children with, um, with disabilities, especially those with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities, maybe express what has happened to them, they may not be, they may not be believed. Um, we often hear people saying, oh, they've made up a story or, or um, they don't understand what, what's happened to them. And so that's obviously a huge barrier to them accessing the right services and, and something we have to be um, thinking about how we address in our GBV and child protection programming. I will stop there and hand over to Betsy. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Emma. So what we're going to do now, um, I just would like to thank Ellen, our colleague, who really did an incredible job of talking us through kind of what is a disability. So it's an impairment that arises uh, when we intersect with a barrier within society. So we're gonna do an activity to drill down a bit more into these specific barriers. Um, what do they look like? How do they impede participation? And what can we do? Um, so I think just bringing back to this idea of if we really are committed to working from a rights-based approach, which is at the core of what we're doing as child protection and GBV practitioners, we have an obligation to do this work, which is identifying the barriers in consultation and collaboration with um, children, youth, and adult with, adults with disabilities, and then making very concrete actions around how do we remove those barriers once we've identified them. So essentially, this activity is something that is really simple. It's a primer that we use in a lot of the work we do around uh, disability inclusion into CP and GBV programming. So as a quick reminder, the four types of barriers that we're looking at uh, primarily are attitudinal, uh, communication related, environmental or physical, which tends to be the most obvious one, um, and policy and administration. So there's a quick little overview of those, but Alam did a great job kept covering that already. So we'll move to the next slide. So on the next slide, what we'll do is an activity where we're going to divide into two groups based on the case studies that we've already started to look at. Uh, group one will be led by my colleague, Emma, and she'll be looking at um, the first case study. And I'll be looking at the second case study, which was Inam. And for each of these case studies, what we'll try to do is identify one potential barrier that could hinder that person's participation in GBV or child protection activities. So a bit of you know, hypothesizing if this person were to come into our either preventative or case management services, what could some of their obstacles look like? And then for each of the barriers or each of the sections, try to identify one concrete action point, which we could take as a programmer, as a case manager, to help to reduce that barrier. Um, so I think this is, you know, a bit of kind of hypothesizing and thinking through what it would look like if this person uh, were to move into services. So I will hand it to Jennifer to support us with dividing out and we're going to take 15 minutes in our separate groups and then we're going to come back and do a bit of sharing. Great. So I'm going to open all the rooms now. So for those of you who have not done this before in Zoom, you'll kind of disappear for a minute and then you'll be automatically put into your group. Um, so, um, and then I'll provide a sort of an, a countdown when the 15 minutes is coming to an end. So here I go.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, everyone should be back from the rooms now and I kind of traverse between the two and it sounds like there was a lot of great discussion. So I'm going to hand back over to Betsy um, to bring us all back together in plenary discussion. Over to you, Betsy. Oops, I think you're on mute, Betsy. Okay. Here we go. Still yeah. getting my coffee into, you know, wake up a bit. Uh, so we had a really great conversation on our group. Um, unfortunately, it's always rushed in this type of situation. And normally the way that M&I facilitate this is flip charts and post-it notes and, and moving around and all those great things. But I tried quickly to capture a few of the key thoughts from our side, and then we'll share a little bit on our case study. Emma will share a quick recap on her side, and then we'll give a few tips on how you could do a similar activity within your organization. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, let's see, great. So essentially we were looking at Inam's case study and we identified a number of attitudinal barriers, primarily um, hypothetically around a worker's attitude towards um, a person with a disability's right for SRH services and understanding of their desires and needs um, to be uh, participating in sexual activities or to be a mother in the future. Um, we also identified kind of a lack of information from Inam where she was internalizing some of her limitations because she didn't have enough information um, or, you know, kind of folks around her to really talk her through what her, her options were. So some strategies we had were kind of capacity building around, you know, the rights of persons with disabilities, disabilities in general, so workers can better understand. Um, and this idea of having an attitudinal assessment that would be tailored towards each worker to make a concrete plan to address some of their potential attitudes that would serve as barriers. Um, we also talked about how did we raise awareness on um, connecting Inam to other peers within her age group. Um, and then we also had this idea of hiring workers with disabilities to serve as um, caseworkers or child protection workers or GBV workers um, with this idea of having some role models inside of our protection programming so folks knew um, that they belonged um, to, in those programming. So we talked about communication, some of her lack of information around what was going on in terms of programming. Um, and I shared this with somebody who we had worked with in the past and there were IEC materials on, um, on youth groups and other um, you know, child adolescent groups that were going on, but she didn't see herself represented in those materials. So even though she didn't have a sensory impairment where she could hear and, and, and she could see images, she never saw a child with a wheelchair, a child who looked like her in the materials that she was seeing. So she just assumed that it wasn't something for her. So we were talking about the importance of making sure our IEC materials are as inclusive and representative as possible so folks kind of see themselves in those activities and know that they are for them. Uh, the most obviously one here was around physical barriers. She's a wheelchair user. So we talked about the isolation and, and initial starting point of house to house visits could be a really effective way to engage her, share information, and develop a plan with her on how to get into group-based activities. Um, and then some of the policy and administration uh, pieces were uh, potentially around her school dropout. Were there policies um, that forced her to not be in school because of her disability? The cost of the care and the medical services and how, how hard her father was working to cover those costs are a barrier. Um, and a, a lack of kind of maybe visioning of potential employment opportunities for her in the future. So some strategies we talked about were you know, the, the really critical role of advocacy in case management, it is a huge tool and sometimes in case management, we get really kind of obsessed with making referrals and making links and forgetting that we as a case manager have a lot we can do to be advocates. So to go to the school to really do that work and, and create access. And we also talked about connecting to social protection programming where possible and, and the value of that 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 has for the household. Um, and those are the main things my group can share in the chat if there's anything that I missed, but those were kind of the core components of our conversation for Enam rapidly. Emma, over to you. Thanks, Betsy. I probably won't share my screen because I realized that my um, sheet that I was using was all formatted for Arabic. So <laughs> it's a bit of a mess <laughs> in English. <laughs> I'm, my apologies to my group for that. Um, however, what we spent most of our time talking about was attitudinal and communication barriers. And in fact, a lot of these crossed over, to be honest. Um, it was quite hard to keep them separate for Thelem. 
So obviously the attitudinal barriers that, that came up straight away were, were really the assumptions of maybe the family, but also of, of our own staff, of the staff that are going to visit this family, maybe inviting children and adolescents to activities that because Salem can't speak and move, that perhaps, you know, she's not going to be able to participate in our activities. And so one of the strategies that was suggested by someone in our group was the importance of getting to know Salem first, getting to know how she communicates, and um, understanding, you know, um, simple, simple cues that she might have to share how she feels when she's happy, when she's sad, um, and trying to map that out first so that staff feel more confident about involving her in activities. Um, we next talked about the fact that her communication right now is quite, um, is quite simple. It is down to simple gestures um, and, emo uh, um, and expressions of emotions. And we thought that there's a good opportunity there to maybe look at how that can be expanded over time with, um, you know, by, through that approach of getting to know her um, and identifying new and different ways that she might communicate. One of the things that someone suggested, which was really great, and I think combines um, both attitudinal and communication, and it was straight to a strategy. It was looking at the fact she enjoys playing with her sisters or watching her sisters play activities. That in itself it can be used in the recreational activities that we're doing um, for um, with children and youth. We can be looking at what she's enjoying and then thinking about adapting the activities accordingly for her based on that. And I really like that because I said to the I said to everyone in our group, I said, well, that's, we're now shifting from look, not looking at what she can't do, but looking at what she can do and building our program around that. Uh, another thing we talked about, which is a crossover between attitude, well, it's actually all attitudinal, is the fact that a lot of people, when they meet someone who can't speak and can't move, might assume they also can't understand. And um, it's really important to recognize that the vast majority, a lot of people who can't speak and can't move can understand a lot of what's happening around them. They can even be given information and be able to process that information. So we shouldn't exclude her from just standard group discussions and activities um, under the assumption that maybe she can't understand what's happening because chances are she might, she might understand and she might be able to get valuable information from just listening to different discussions that are happening. Obviously, the environmental barriers are that um, the centre is a bit too far away um, and in refugee camps like what we have in, in Ethiopia, you know, physically you have to usually walk to those camps, uh, to those centres. Um, and, and she's getting big. She's a, she's a teenager. She's quite large. And so it's hard for her mother to carry her and she doesn't want to leave her on her, her own. So we did um, start to talk briefly about, um, about making sure that we address transportation or perhaps looking at activities that can be conducted closer to home and build the protective peer networks at home, um, you know, with women that live nearby, girls that live nearby, because um, that, that is actually that, that small neighbourhood space Space is actually um, is actually Selim's, um, you know, that's her world at the moment. And how do we make that as safe as possible? Maybe it's running activities the closer to home. So um, that's about as far as we got. I'm afraid we didn't get to policy and administrative. Sorry, Betsy, we talked too much. <laughs> that's all right. Great, thanks, Emma. So, you know, just as a quick kind of wrap up for this activity, um, normally this is an activity that we, we really recommend you doing kind of at an organizational level. You know, it's a great kind of engagement activity or primer for folks in your organization who are programmers or who are in human resources, who are outside of the service provision or the GBVCP side to really think about how are you creating accessible and inclusive programs. So, we have more on how to do this activity in the toolkit that we'll be sharing later. Um, but I think the main point to take away is that it's critically important to remove barriers, identify them, and not set up separate programming, but really think about how do we get children and youth into the programming that we have so that we're not further marginalizing them or excluding them from their peers. Um, and this is truly how you operationalize the rights-based perspective. So this activity we did now is something great to do, obviously in consultation with any client or people with disabilities in your community. And we can share more tips on how to do that in a really empowering uh, process. But you know, we may have some ideas, but we often find once we do the first round of that kind of table, 
internally with our staff and then we open it up and we consult folks with disabilities, the strategies just start really flowing and coming out. So um, I think it's, it's, a great, it's a really simple way to do this. So uh, remember, let's not focus on the disability, let's focus on the specific barrier um, and use consultation as a way to really generate innovative and creative ideas for overcoming barriers. Um, and that is really the secret to success for improving participation. Um, so consult with children and youth and really consult with caregivers as well. Um, they will have a lot of strategies that we won't think of on our own. Uh, so that's a primer for next week. Next week, we'll look at this on a more individual micro level of how we apply removing barriers in the case management steps and processes. So I think to wrap us up, because we're getting there, um, we want to move forward into a small goal setting activity. Um, and so what I would like us to do is think about some of the barriers that we just talked through specific to those case studies and see if there's anything that resonates um, as a barrier that you've seen in your own work, whether that be in child protection programming, um, in GBV programming, and in any sort of community programming. Is there a specific barrier that you're identifying in your community where you're working or the organization that you're working in? And then is there one very small concrete action that you can take based on the position that you sit in within your organization to try and work on addressing or removing or decreasing this barrier? Um, and something that's really actionable, something you can maybe accomplish within the next four weeks. Um, and it may be a really small initiative, um, but I'd love for you to think from an organization or community perspective, um, within your sphere of influence, what is one thing that you could do in the next month um, to try and increase disability inclusion and reduce a particular barrier? Um, so I'd encourage you to just maybe take one minute uh, to reflect on that and anyone who's comfortable to share it in the chat box um, as a way to inspire us and feel free to borrow from other people. Maybe we're, we're all facing similar barriers, um, but I'm gonna give everybody one minute to really think about what is something they can do, one point they can take away um, and they can work on in the next month within their organization. So I'm gonna keep an eye on the chat if anyone wants to share. Or if anyone wants to raise their hand or share out loud, they're welcome to do that as well. This is Jennifer from UNFP Zambia Country Office. Hi, Jennifer. Do you have a goal for us? Yes, please. Great. We are, yes, um, UNFP Country Office with the UNDP. We are going to do an assessment to evaluate the effect of COVID-19 to people with disabilities in selected UNFP supported provinces. There are about three provinces, and we have already done the terms of reference. We are engaging the consultant to help us do a rapid assessment. Over. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Yeah, so consultation. I think that is a fantastic way to start, assess, and consult, and learn more before we make a plan. So that's, that's great. I'm excited for you. Um, somebody's going to work on an attitudinal assessment that you like, and, and we'll share a tool in a few minutes on a, a good starting tool for, for that. She's gonna, someone will share, Jennifer Lee's gonna, um, oh, she's sharing the, uh, the recording of this session, great. Yes, please. Great. All right, anyone else, please keep going. I'm, I'm gonna pass it back over. Um, but as we move on, Emma's gonna give an overview of some really hopefully helpful tools and resources we've developed over the years. But please keep using the, the chat to share some of your goals so we can uh, learn from each other, thanks. Thanks, Betsy. Um, one of the things I, I should have mentioned earlier on is, is most of the a lot of the work that Betsy and I have done over the years um, on GBV and disability um, has been in partner has been actually under the Women's Refugee Commission. So a lot of the tools I'm going to share right now are from the Women's Refugee Commission. Um, so the first toolkit that you can see on the screen is a toolkit for GBV practitioners that we developed in partnership with IRC. Now this toolkit, if you're looking for an attitudinal assessment, there's some great um, attitudinal assessments in there. 
Um, we also have um, a whole range of advice for case workers and case managers on supporting persons with disabilities. It is definitely taken from more of an adult perspective, but you will find still some really great um, uh, in, information in there and tools that you can adapt to working with adolescent and child survivors. Um, the second toolkit is one that was developed with Child Fund um, International and this toolkit is a very much a community based how to involve children with and without disabilities in community based risk assessments relating to GBV and it gives you a full on participatory process that you can do with children. Um, it's a great example of how doing activities with children with and without disabilities together is really actually very effective. Um, you know, they work as a team, they help each other, they support each other, and they oftentimes come up with um, strategies relating to disability inclusion that would not have been brought forth in a group of just children without disabilities. So I think we also have an attitudinal um, scale, an attitudinal activity in that one as well that you can have a look at. Um, also, what's great in both of these toolkits is we actually have activities that you can integrate into training packages. Um, so when you're doing your usual child protection, GBV training, have a look at some of the materials that are here because you might want to integrate them into a standard training that you're doing on, um, on child protection concerns um, or how GBV, safe identification and referral of GBV survivors. Um, so please have a look at that. Uh, next slide, please, Jennifer. Uh, this is another toolkit that we developed in Lebanon. And the reason I'm flagging this up he here is because it was very much focused on um, the intersection between GBV and psychosocial support and how we can um, for women, children and youth with disabilities. And so there's a lot of really valuable tools in here. One tool that is in here is an informed consent flowchart, um, which we'll talk a bit more about next week. But this, this flowchart, I have to stress, is designed for adult survivors. Having said that, the process of going through and, and sharing information in different formats, um, as, uh, determining what someone can and can't understand in terms of the information you're giving and then adapting how you're sharing that information, um, understanding what their opinions are and looking, weighing up the risks in relation to any course of action. All of that is still completely relevant for working with a child or adolescent survivor. I guess the main difference is that in, when working with a child or, or adolescent survivor is that you also want to identify a trusted adult to work with them. And we'll talk more about that next week, some of the key considerations um, to take forward in case management and casework. Um, next slide, please. Uh, also, we have lots of examples of where we've developed tools um, in different formats for you to uh, have a look at. Um, so this is an example of a tool that we developed for Lebanon, which is about, um, is about child protection and, and GBV, so together, and it's an, what we call an easy to read version. So it's, it's been um, developed and, and tested um, by people with intellectual disabilities. Um, having said that, I use a lot of easy to read versions of all kinds of things because I honestly just find them easier to understand. And I think that we should remember that easy to read is versions can be useful for all types of communication with all types of community members. Um, so that's just one example. I know that Betsy mentioned um, just a moment ago in uh, her group discussion that there was this idea of how do we make um, sure that um, messages resonate um, with people with different types of disabilities. I think it's in the IRC toolkit that we have. Um, you'll find actually a, a sheet, a, a sort of worksheet on how to develop um, accessible, you know, IEC materials. When you're doing IEC materials, how to assess whether they're inclusive and whether they're going to resonate with persons with disabilities. So I direct you to that tool um, if you're developing up any kind of IEC materials, because it's a really nice process. Um, next slide, please. Emma, oh, just one, <laughs> one, yeah, just one point on that. So, you know, we, we talk about a lot of these materials we've developed over the years, and you'll see the majority of them are not developed to be huge standalone TOTs. You know, they're really meant to be kind of pulled apart and take what you need because our overall goal would be that you are kind of mainstreaming disability training components into your core child protection or GBV training that you're already doing. So for example, the case studies we shared today, 
versus doing that as a standalone training, could you borrow some case studies to integrate into other work you're already doing on case management training? So that's part of the reason a lot of the stuff you'll see, they're, they're created as separate documents in toolkits with this idea that we would really love to see this content get mainstreamed into your big overall organizational trainings, if that makes sense, versus you know, always having standalone disability specific trainings. Our, our main vision would be that this just becomes core bread and butter of what we train when it comes to child protection and GBV. So that's my little final point on that. Thanks, Betsy. Great point. Yeah, I love that last point, Betsy. Um, I see that there's been a ton of activity in the chat, which is great with all of you exchanging goals and ideas um, and resources. So we only have a few minutes left, but I'm going to pass over to Sarah Martin um, to facilitate a brief Q&A for a few minutes, um, and then we can move on to closing out the session. Um, so over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I'm hiding behind my camera, um, but um, if you, um, what the, there's not been any um, direct questions yet, but please type them in the chat box. We did have a little bit of um, back and forth. Um, Pamela of the Riga in uh, Asia said that the whole of Syria approach has adapted this for disability on um, data on disability. And um, um, our colleagues at UNFPA in Palestine are interested in sharing that. So um, we can very much uh, use the GBV AOR community of practice. We have a Dropbox on there where if you have materials that you are interested in sharing or looking at, you know, it's open to all of us. So you can uh, join us and find out more about that. Any more questions from you guys? Somebody would like you to say the name of the checklist for the IEC materials again, please. I'm going to find the link right now and drop it in yeah, the box. Yeah, do you mind? <laughs> <laughs> great. And and it's will, a great table, and I will find it and drop it in the box right now. <laughs> very, it's very easy to use as well. It's, it's only like a page. Like it's not, it's not like an essay. You know, it's not a manual. It's just like a page of, I think, five steps you should take when you're developing IEC materials. Um, thank you, There's Betsy. <laughs> There's actually a question to one of our participants. Pamela, do you know if there were any uh, challenges that the Syrian colleagues faced when they were trying to do uh, disability disaggregated or adapting the questions? We can reach out. Uh, the, the adaptation that they did was actually featured in the GBV coordination handbook. So I will reach out and check if they can share the actual adapted tool that they used. Okay. And we can perhaps do some cross fertilization and connection with the colleagues from UNFPA who would like to get additional information. Great. Thank you. If, if I can just share one reflection on data disaggregation, if that's okay. Um, I know the whole of Syria has done uh, some great work on this and, and they're very, uh, I know that some things went really well and other things were quite challenging. Um, I would just, just say with data disaggregation, remember that it's not just always about assessing, right? It's also about monitoring. It's about monitoring who's accessing your programs. Um, so for example, you can just do really simple stuff. Like if you're running a group discussion with women on GBV or mothers on, on child protection, you know, how many mothers of children with disabilities are actually in your group or how many mothers with disabilities are in your group? If we're getting a representative sample, you're gonna have maybe two, two, two out of 10 in your group are gonna have a disability. Um, so just look at simple things like that that you can start doing and tracking, like are we really reaching people with disabilities, children with disabilities, adolescents with disabilities, and can we actually, you know, strategically reach out and invite some? Maybe we haven't invited them yet. <laughs> um, so I just encourage you to go for that real simple stuff first. Any more questions from anyone before I hand it back over to Jennifer? Okay, you'll see in the chat box that there's um, uh, some more things have been uh, shared um, that you can download and we will send out to everyone the PowerPoint presentation and the recording of this for everyone who's signed up um, and we'll be chatting about it more in the two communities of practice. And Betsy reminds everyone if you haven't shared your goal yet, there's still time writing it down will help it make it come true. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thanks for that. Um, the contributions from Betsy, Emma, and Pam and others in the group. Um, just quickly as we close out, just a couple of announcements and reminders. Um, first, next week's webinar is on key considerations for a case management approach with child and adolescent survivors with disabilities. Um, same time um, next Thursday. Um, and also, I just wanted to flag, Sarah had shared this in the chat earlier, but if you are in more of a coordination role um, and are looking to kind of have a sort of more overview, um, but not necessarily overview, um, but for lack of better words, the GBV AOR is doing a series in October around survivors with disabilities. And I think this is centered around the IASC uh, um, disability guidelines. So please be on the lookout for that. And obviously there's information on this slide to join the GBV community of practice, the AO GBV AOR community of practice. Um, and by doing that, you'll definitely get more information. Obviously, if you want more information about the child protection GBV community of practice, um, you can reach out to me. And I've also put in um, the chat, and Sarah has kindly also put in the chat the link for the feedback survey, because I think this really would be helpful for, for all of us as we um, prepare for next week's session as well. Um, I just wanted to really thank Elham, Emma, and Betsy um, just for taking the lead and facilitating and um, this session and sharing with us. Um, I saw in the chat how valuable it was for many people and also how many people are also going to be using this learning right away. So that's really amazing. So um, a big thank you um, to Elham, Emma and Betsy. And as you see, their contact information is all here and we'll be sure to share this out following the webinar. Um, some final words. I was actually going to ask um, Emma or Betsy if um, you wanted to read these quotes, given that these are um, individuals that you've worked with. Um, do you want to share, Emma? I, um, there's two final sort of. Sure, I'll do the first one. Um, so this is a girls group in northern, in the Northern Caucasus in the Russian Federation, who we actually involved in an evaluation for a for a GBV, it was a GB, sort of GBV program. And this is how they fed back their, uh, this was their feedback to us. Um, they had a whole bunch of things they wanted us to do, but they said, when I see there are persons with disabilities, I feel like I am not alone. And when I see other non-disabled people there, I feel I am equal. Awesome. And then Betsy, do you want to read um, the one from Sifa? So the next is a, a young girl that was very engaged in uh, community participation we did with GBV and um, IRC team and, and, and the Women's Refugee Commission. And she had so much to share, but these words really stuck with me, which was, it's important to me that the community sees me not just as a girl without a leg, but as a person with rights and a future. I can work hard and I can prove that despite what they said to me in the hospital in the Congo, I am not worthless. Instead, I am a girl with a lot to share and a lot to offer. Um, and she really, um, what I loved about her is she really just really identified as a girl and wanted to be part of programs for girls. And, and most of the programs she had been invited to were around older people with disabilities and rehab services and, and, and CBR programming. And she just was desperate to be part of the girls groups and the girls empowerment activities. And, and that happened because the workers made it happen. So she's always been somebody who's, who's really inspired me. And she was um, really engaged with a lot of ideas when we went through this process. So. Thanks for giving room for that, Jennifer. Yeah, awesome. Um, thanks so much, Betsy and Emma, for sharing those. And I really love ending with the voices of girls. Um, and so thanks, everyone, again, for joining this session. We amazingly kept a pretty good time. And please um, join us next week for our part two of this webinar series. Um, thank you, everyone. And big thank you again to Sarah, Elham, Emma, and Betsy. Um, take care and hope these um, final words from these two girls stay with you the rest of your morning, afternoon, or evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank